Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. This is Mike with Greek University, and this is Fraternity Foodie. There is nothing like food that brings people together, so we are going to tackle some of the really difficult conversations in these interviews, and we're also going to get the inside scoop on where our guests like to eat and where we can go to get their favorite meal. Today, I am so excited. We have Nicole Morse with us today. Nicole is the Assistant Director of Student Leadership and Activities at St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We have been friends for years, and I am so excited that Nicole is with us today. Welcome to the show, Nicole. Thanks, Mike. And uh -huh. yeah, friends for years. People still mistake me as a student, though, so I've got to be careful <laughs> saying that. That's a good thing. I don't think that anyone really confuses me for a student these days. No, so. I keep saying, say it as long as possible. It just means I have a good moisturizing routine. <laughs> I'll take it while I can. Absolutely. I wish that was comments that were pointed to me. <laughs> so uh, let's get started. So obviously you were a member of Delta Gamma and that was at UConn, but you probably didn't have a typical experience of an undergraduate sorority member. So what made your experience at UConn unique? So there's a lot of things that made my experience at UConn unique. Um, one of them is it took me six and a half years to graduate. So I went in, I was all in. I knew I wanted to be Greek. My mother had been a Delta Zeta um, at the University of Connecticut. And I went through the process and that was for sure where I thought it was going to go. I didn't end up there. I ended up in Delta Gamma. Um, I had a really great, amazing new member period. Um, I went in and I moved into our sorority house um, in my sophomore year, 19 years old. Um, had a leadership position as a director and was really close to my big sister. Um, February of my sophomore year, I was sexually assaulted in my sorority house um, with some of my sisters um, in the room next door. Um, they had driven me, sober driven me home, um, knowing that there was something going on and not stepping in. Um, and when that police investigation happened, I went to my honor board, my standards, and let them know. Um, but rumors went through my chapter and there was a woman in my pledge class who decided to tell people I was selling drugs. And that's why the police were in my room. I chose to move out of the sorority house and um, there was no action taken against the person um, that we had evidence for and he was still on campus. I had a really tough time. I medically withdrew from school, became a commuter student. I went early alum and by the age of 21, I was Hartford, Connecticut's alumni president um, and helping to advise and do these senior bridge ceremonies um, and I started advising at the University of Hartford while I was still completing my degree, um, helping them like talk about these traditional four years of college while working full time, going to school part time, um, being a commuter student and having a really abnormal experience that they weren't aware of. They just thought I was a really young alum um, that was cool enough to go back. Um, and it just wasn't the case. Like I kind of felt robbed out of my four years of sorority and fraternity life and found that connection and like and what I needed through becoming a really young alum and advising and getting involved in my alumni experience. Um, so I was a very atypical undergraduate student. Um, there was a lot of trauma there and um, right before I graduated I also found out that I had been suffering with symptoms of multiple sclerosis um, for a really long time. So then I became a student with a disability. Um, so I kind of had all of these lenses all at the same time and kind of very few people um, that I joined with knew uh, what happened and there's a lot of typical sorority experiences that women in undergraduate chapters have that I never had the opportunity to experience because of um, kind of the path and the curveballs life threw me. Yeah, I am so sorry that that situation happened. I know we've spent a lot of time talking about that together. Um, and it just amazes me in terms of what an advocate you are for fraternity and sorority, despite the fact that you didn't have a typical experience. I mean, that to me just blows me away because I know that you're such a, a fierce advocate for fraternity and sorority life. And I think it came down to like 
there were three women that changed my perception. And without those three women, I would have written off the experience. And one was my little sister, who was a woman who drove me to the hospital and sat by my side and told me like, we will always be friends. Um, doesn't matter. You're my big sister. Just got invited to her wedding. So congratulations, Alex, if you ever listen. Um, one was my chapter advisor, who when I came in to that honor board, that standards hearing and said like, this is what's going on. I brought in my pin for Delta Gamma and I was like, I know that I can't continue. And she looked me straight in the face and said, that's not what sisterhood is and it never will be. And I'm going to put you in touch with an alum who's going to help you. And she helped me get early alum status. And then she put me in touch and her name is Jesse. Thank you, Jesse. And she put me in touch with Lorraine, who was a regional director and alum who had an amazing collegiate experience and had volunteered for years and we had one phone conversation she was like want to be the vice president of communications for our alum association like let's get you involved like i love your enthusiasm you're tech savvy we need your help and if it wasn't for her i never would have gotten involved in the alum chapter so those three women just saying you don't know what sisterhood is like it is when you fall down, I'll pick you up and I'll give you another chance. Those are the three women who like saved my faith in friendship as a whole. And I didn't meet Lorraine until almost four and a half years after she gave me and appointed me that opportunity. We just had a virtual relationship. And I met her at a leadership retreat for Delta Gamma. And I just hugged her and I was like, you have no idea how much you saved my life. And it's those like small little moments that like someone just told you like, oh no, that's not, sisterhood is different than what you think. You're like, we'll get through this. We'll get through it together. And I think, I've thanked all three of those women countless times for just being affiliated, like being a sister because they changed my faith in humanity on a whole and made me believe that sorority could really save lives and like, could rescue people that needed it and could be there and be an outpost that women don't have. Yeah. I'm so grateful for those women because without them, I feel like we wouldn't have had all of your contributions to fraternity and sorority life. So I'm also grateful that uh, they were able to help you and they were such an influence, a positive influence in your career. Um, and obviously you've been very involved, I think, both at NASPA and also at Delta Gamma while you were attending the yeah. University of Bridgeport for your master's in counseling and college student personnel. So what pushed you to be so involved in so many different things as a grad student? So while I was finishing my degree, being whatever I was, uh, this a very adult learner who was going part time, I was working at a hospital. And I loved working overnight emergency department shifts because you got shift differential. So Friday, Saturday nights, you made an extra $10 an hour. It was great. But through that, I saw the amount of college men and women that were enrolled in colleges, were going to community colleges, and came in for um, assaults, domestic violence, sexual assaults, mental health crises, schizophrenia, suicidal ideation, and substance abuse, and homelessness was appalling to me. Like, I just couldn't believe that, like, these people were the same age, kind of going through the same life things, and I had really hard life challenges, and there were days that, you know, I felt like I was having trouble coping, and then to see how severe some of this stuff really was and the accidents and the actual suicides that came in and you were sitting here and had to watch families grieve and i was at a small community hospital it was i was not from a big city i knew i wanted to go to the epicenter i was like i'm i'm gonna go to a college like they're doing something wrong and it was not and I find this funny because like everyone I know that is in, they're like, I fell into it. I was an RA. I loved college, like blah, blah. I was like, I hated college. Yeah. One of the worst times in my life. And I was there because I had like a fire. I was like, I'm going to change it. Like I'm going to be that person on a college campus. That's like going to make a difference. And how like young and full of life I was to think that like I could be that one person that was going to change everything. But I felt like if I had had that one person on my college campus, they could have changed everything for me. So I went in and I 
I had a, I, it was just, I had a fire lit under me. I was like, I'm going to change the way student affairs professionals interact with their students. I didn't know I wanted to go into fraternity and sorority. My graduate assistantship was in student health services. I did a lot of like um, get yourself tested and um, mental health awareness and Title IX and domestic violence um, and vigils. And I did a lot of res life and student conduct and accountability workshops. And I did a lot of academic success tutoring because those are also areas that I was passionate about that students come in and need intervening with. Um, and somehow like fraternity and sorority like encompassed all of that. And I was like, oh, I could do this. It's like I can wear every hat that I love and have all these really critical conversations instead of just one type of critical conversation. Um, but I, I had no idea and I had no idea that student affairs professionals existed. I applied to one program and uh, my graduate director, I, it was the only one I like checked the box, didn't know what it meant, went in for the interview and she accepted me right on the spot. And I remember her handing me a thing, go, go apply here, get housing, like you're starting in literally four weeks. And I was like, oh, sure. And I had, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And I think her name's Sarah Connolly. I thank her all the time for just giving me an opportunity because I was a weird student with an atypical experience who didn't have leadership experience beyond uh, really fraternity and sorority, um, who didn't know how to lead um, a college campus effectively. And she just saw that fire and kind of stoked it for two years. Um, and I left and graduated fired up as just as I came in. And um, it was a great program and I had a lot of time, uh, but they pushed me in every direction. If you're interested, do it. If you're interested, do it. If you're interested, do it. So I tried everything and had a lot of support from the faculty and, and staff in that program um, to explore the things I was curious about and to make changes and to do research and present nationally on that research and like apply for that grant, like go ahead, create that program because it was a really tiny school and it was all hands on deck. I did not go to grad school with a lot of structure. They were understaffed, budget cuts, and those grad students, like, they needed them to work. And I'm so glad that I was in that place where I was just treated with the utmost respect as a professional um, because we, we were and we did, we did the work. And everyone in my cohort was like that, but um, it was an amazing opportunity for me. Yeah, I feel like, like the sun is weird, so I'm so sorry if you're watching this digitally. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. It sounds like a perfect program for you. And it's great that you got exposed yeah. to so many different things. And it allowed you to figure out really what you wanted to focus on as a professional. So perfect fit. Absolutely. Yeah. So one of the things you worked on at Delta Gamma was the curriculum for human dignity workshop for education on bystander intervention. Um, or bystander prevention for hazing and also sexual assaults. So what made that particular curriculum so special to you? So it's interesting. So Delta Gamma, I was the second uh, graduate intern that had come uh, through that. So it was a very new program. And the summer before, um, they like to revise that human dignity pro um, program every summer. So it was just one of those programs and curriculums that they, was just on my task list. And they were like, you're gonna complete that and it's something you're gonna work on this summer. Um, here's some past examples. Here's what the intern last semester or last year did. Um, let us know. You have literally a summer to create um, these four different kind of tracks. Um, and the four tracks, we you know, kind of the chapter could take a quiz to figure out which curriculum would best suit the needs of their chapter. And so I ended up watching all these TED Talks and like talking to all these other people and doing all this research and finding out that, well, writing curriculum is way harder than you think, um, especially if you know it's going out to over 100 chapters all across North America and Canada um, that have different needs and different chapter sizes and making sure that all of those programs are reachable. And I was lucky enough to have mentors and staff at Delta Gamma um, executive offices that would sit down and like critique my curriculum and give me curriculum examples and uh, but it was it was stuff I was already passionate about and had this knowledge base for and I had these ideas and I had the ability to talk about these ideas and I was like 
yeah, put me in coach. Like I can talk to a room of students and get my feelings across. And I felt like I could do it effectively, but putting it on a piece of paper and making sure that my voice was maybe heard from like a facilitation guide that a junior at some college I've never even heard of in California could follow and get that same passion across to her students was like a skill I did not have or even think about trying to cultivate until um, until I was there and working with um, the executive office's education team. So I really fell in love with the concept of human dignity and the fact that it covers and embraces and is so transparent across so many things. So we often use it for hazing and what human dignity you know means and how hazing violates human dignity we use it for sexual assault in the same type of capacity but i had never really identified with the concept of human dignity until writing that curriculum and then it became like that was that was where i stuck as a professional and will keep sticking is like the concept and conversation around what human dignity is and how dignity um is violated and what dignity is and um, how it's inherent and should be respected in all capacities just is cross-conversational um, across so many topics that we have to have with our students um, and uh, I don't know what else to say I'm a big big fan I love that you know um, uh, another good friend of mine named Mike in Dignity U and that program came out and when he presented it um, at over the summer when I was in Baton Rouge like I fell in love with what he the work he was doing around dignity and how his message is you know similar and so unique and how he's getting to the heart of a conversation and how uh, students and professionals and adults can just connect with it in such a different way than the words um, hazing or sexual assault or racism or homophobia when you talk about dignity you feel like this is inherent like I have dignity um, it's something you have and how do you build it in other people and it doesn't feel so much of like a violation um, or we're talking about what you've done wrong right. um, though it get dignity always gets to the heart of that because it makes you examine yourself and makes you examine how you respect your own dignity and respect the dignity of others I said dig dignity so many times in this conversation <laughs> um, we can do a tracker account I <laughs> that'll be a fun game uh, don't turn it into a drinking game though ASTP let's be responsible that's right. I love it. I love your approach. So yeah. as a grad assistant at Bridgeport, you were also very involved in empowerment and awareness events for sexual assaults. And I know yes. that there are students all over the country that are looking for new ideas. I know there you did the Take Back the Night program. You had the Red Flag campaign, also not on our campus. So what did those events look like at Bridgeport, just in case there are students out there looking for new ideas? I think like the red flag campaign was so there's you know passive and interactive programming and then you have speakers so speakers can come in and really um light up a crowd because they're passionate or they have these experiences that are life-changing and there's so many amazing companies such as your own that bring in speakers that can and can do that and really hit home on a topic or make you think differently about a topic because they have that personal connection that you and that they're willing and open and vulnerable enough to share um, so I love speakers. And then you have those educational ones that are collaborative and invite students into the conversation in a really tangible way by ha having them do self-reflection exercises. Um, so you have things like, um, you know, tabling and asking them to share or like sign a pledge or do something or like these hands don't haze, like let's put the handprint up. Um, something that they have to tangibly do. And I think a lot of the times we go there and then we have all these passive campaigns like the red flag campaigns and things where you post red flags with statistics around campus so that people are walking through basically an interactive art form, but you have to see the statistics or the faces or um, the stories of these students that are um, 
have been affected, um, no matter who, what their identity is, their ages, um, their status as a student. These are real, real stories. So you see that with people hanging up jeans um, across fences, or the red flags with statistics, or you know, Team One Love and their walk, and they actually put up the faces of victims who have lost their lives to domestic violence in college. Um, or, I mean, there's so many amazing of those like passive uh, things that you're not always interacting with, but you see them and they stick with you. Um, and I think comprehensively, you have to think about how you can incorporate all three. And to make the best type of program, it's great if you have someone who can speak, um, whether that's a professional on your campus, whether your council or chapter has the budgetary alignment to bring in an outside speaker, um, whether you have um, a CAPS professional or a local um, Center for Family Justice or a sexual assault treatment center or um, a SANE nurse who will come in and give that real life experience. Um, and then tie it with, what are you doing? Like, how are you pledging? How are you following up? How are you getting new students who have just heard this to interact with the mission that you're having? And I think we fail to combine all three things um, in a tangible way to start a movement. I don't think there's, you know, one guaranteed type of program. I think they all overlap. Um, and I also think it's about honest, vulnerable conversation. And I think you see that with amazing student leaders that you are just sad when they leave because they can command a room and, and spark a conversation like no one else. But there's always those change leaders, those thought leaders, those people who go in and, and are just the cool kids that everyone wants to follow. If you get them excited about changing culture or changing the conversation in a way that matters, then you can create real change. Um, and that's with our advisors. Um, that's within our own community, especially our AFA community. Like we go to these conventions, like we know that there are professionals that have been here for so long and they set the trends and they wore this bag and you'll see that color pop up and everyone's going to their event and everyone seems to stop and say hi to them and talk to them. If they're not producing quality, intense conversations and critical conversations within our community, no one else is either. Because they're going to be too, like, if the people I look up to as a young professional aren't talking about, um, for example, disability rights within recruitment and access to our spaces, because if you have a disability, no one else is going to be talking about it because it seems like it's on no one's radar. So we also have to look at like our ability to command other professionals, but then our ability to be the thought leaders on our own campus with our own communities and our own set of leaders and be vulnerable about that. My students know I have a disability. They know when they have to call 911 because I'm not doing well and I go over signs and symptoms. Um, they know that like my grandfather and my mother, like my mother grew up with an alcoholic father and that is important to me and that's why I can talk about alcohol and drug um, relations and that's why it matters to me. Um, they know um, in the right capacity that I was a victim of sexual assault in my college years in my sorority house. And when that conversation ha hits and that story becomes relevant to that conversation, um, my vulnerability in that moment changes. There, it, you can see the automatic shift. Um, I just did a, I went in as a visiting lecturer to a classroom literally three hours ago and I already have um, and I talked about behind happy faces and did a program about how to recognize mental health and distress in your friends and when you can help and when to seek help and when to call 911 and I have three I can see them popping up I have three students who I've never met before literally didn't bring my business card so I don't know how they found me uh, but they I guess they remembered my name found me and they all are requesting for me to come into their sports clubs, their acapella, and their band. And it's just because I was vulnerable and had an authentic, real story about mental health. Um, I don't think 
maybe not all of us as professionals have that story, but you have a story of a student that you helped through that. You have a story that you can relate to or a friend or family member. And I think sometimes we, we worry that we're going to cr cross that professional boundary. Well, like that boundary <laughs> has kind of been blown up and torn to pieces in the past couple of years because our students um, are interacting digitally with these issues and suffering from them in more severe ways than ever before. We have students that we've never had on our campuses before. And if you're not going to be authentic about it, then who is? Um, and the fact of the matter is, is a lot of them are first gen students who can't go home or can't talk to anyone else. And you might be literally the only person who has ever been honest about mental health, sexual assault, alcoholism, hazing, to their faces in their entire lives. And I think that's really important. I think that's what makes you so good at what you do is being vulnerable and having those authentic conversations. I talk to fraternity members and sorority members every week all across the country. And I tell them, if you want real connections, that's what you have to do. Many yep. of them are talking about their recruitment events and they say that it feels artificial or the vibe isn't really right. And I said, just have authentic, real conversations and they will open up too. And that is ultimately what gets you the connections that you're looking for. Um, and I think and like, bring it back to food. If you can't think of anything else to have an authentic conversation about, right. there's always food. Everyone has a favorite cheese. Like it's just the truth. Yeah, absolutely. Now, when we first met and you were over at SUNY Oswego, I yes. noticed right away that you had great relationships with the students there. I think you worked so closely with them um, as uh, the student involvement advisor there. So what were some of the proudest moments that you had at SUNY Oswego and what were some of the challenges there? Oh, well, the challenge really was is that they had gone through a lot of transitions through fraternity and sorority advisors. Um, I was their first full, full-time advisor. So before it kind of been like they were an involvement advisor plus this, or they did, um, it was 40% of their job, 60% of their job. There's always other programming that kind of took them away um, from that responsibility. Um, I think just like a lot of other institutions, uh, upward mobility at the university had stopped at some point. So you're rotating through these new professionals um, because they're not growing and they're not going into new leadership positions. So hierarchy doesn't change. Um, and funding had been massively cut. Like basically my job was if I could print it on a piece of paper, I could do it. If you can like PowerPoint and a piece of paper, that's what you have for a programming budget. Um, and they were really disillusioned with all of it. Like we're Greek, it's just social, like no one cares, the university hates us, uh, they don't care about us, um, it, this is really drinking. Like that's what we're here for, that's why people join, they recruited in the bars, um, and I don't think that's abnormal for a lot of our larger schools that feel disconnected to their advisors. Like who are you to come in and talk about this? Um, and my first aha moment was literally pulling up a picture of my chapter closing and being like, I come from a closed chapter. My chapter of Delta Gamma does not exist. My little sister will never go there. My, like, my legacy, when you Google my chapter, even though I was not in the chapter at this time, this is what you will see. Do you want to be there? And like, they all just like snapped and they're like, oh, I can't believe they hired someone from a closed chapter. Like you must have been. And I was like, but it was like to kind of get that connection and get some buy-in to be like, you know, chapters aren't perfect and I'm not from a perfect chapter. And you kind of saw their attitude change in that moment of vulnerability where I could share that like, I wasn't from a perfect chapter. We weren't winning any awards right now for anything. Like our charter hangs in a basement somewhere. Um, and you saw them start asking for things. And that was really, really important to me is like, hey, can we add this? Hey, I think we need this. And through those asking is, it's like, we did an emerging leadership institute um, and we called it Lettered Leaders. And that grew and we had 12 people the first semester. Six of those came back to then facilitate the next semester and we had 32. And then we had 12 of them come back and facilitate 56. 
And even now that I'm gone, those students that helped facilitate came back and they're running the program on their own. They have my curriculum. They asked me if there's anything they should add, even though I left, and they ran the entire program. Um, we did Behind the Red Cup and we did some digital campaigns or like Greeks don't have to drink. Um, they have some more longstanding and concrete relationships with departments on campuses that like had never really been able to work with them or feel aligned with them. Um, you saw philanthropy and the style of philanthropies that they were doing really increase. And to be asked to go to those philanthropies was just a lot of fun. Um, even though they, they were shocked that someone would want to come. Like, oh, you, you want to come to our philanthropy? Yeah, I do. Like, okay, you want to wear a t-shirt? Like, what do you want? Can we, you know, can we get you, like, put a sticker on your car? Like, can we chalk your car? And the fact that I was like, I'll wear your letters for a day. Like, cool, give me your philanthropy t-shirt. Like, I'm all in. They wanted just the, someone to be the biggest supporter of them, even in their failures, to look them in the face and be like, yeah, you failed but I support you and I know that you'll get better. And it was just incredible to see the amount of leadership change in the two years I was there um, the positions they added to their councils. Um, we launched RFM and did formal recruitment for the first time um, in years on campus. And the last time they had done it, it hadn't been as successful. And um, this coming weekend they're doing it for the third year in a row and watching all their recruitment videos come out like I still feel so connected and commenting on all their Instagram posts and all their leadership things and I still have leaders that reach out to me for letters of support and it just means a lot that even my graduated leaders like want to keep in touch and keep asking me like can we come visit you in Philly and I'm like that's <laughs> kind of weird no like, don't, please don't come out here to my new job. Um, just high five me virtually. Thank you. But they are so invested in my success um, because I got invested in theirs. And that's one, like posting that I was moving to a new job and having them just cheer me on and still cheer me on and want to email me and check in to see how I am and what I'm doing. Um, it's just great. And my, my proudest moments really are just those, some of those individual connections and those moments where I feel like I helped a student out. And I don't, I'm sure there are students that I helped that have never reached out to me um, and never will, but um, it's, it's just those, like I see, as you're asking this, I just see these like individual faces and these individual moments where I really felt like I made a change or like I saw a light bulb go off. Um, that I'm proud of. And we had some really tough conversations and there was a lot of crying people in my office. Um, and I, I don't know, I felt like I made a difference there. Um, and, and I think I did by the amount of students that still uh, decide to comment on every picture I post of my dog. Um, but I, I just, yeah, it was a great first position for me. Um, very cold though i you know <laughs> oswego can change that i don't know the snow tornadoes or something i, I do not miss uh, everyone here is like oh philly's so freezing i'm like i can swim like at any time <laughs> i don't know who's calling me all right well you made a positive impact on those students so yes. that's Excellent. Um, so now you're at St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia. Have you noticed any difference in terms of the students there? Oh, yes. How it's, are they different? It's a much different even like student population. So um, it's a Jesuit institution. So we're connected to a church. A lot of my students went to, I don't want to like overgeneralize, but a lot of them did go to um, private uh, Catholic high schools. And that's a different experience than uh, Oswego, which a lot of my students went to public high schools like in the city um, or in Long Island, um, you know, in the Bronx, in Brooklyn. And a lot of them, this was not, like Oswego was a safety school for them and they, they'll be open and honest. Um, you know, it's a state system. They want to get their money's worth. They're working on the side. Um, like an extra $10 in dues will throw people into a panic. Like really it was, it, it was a different type of world. And then here being private, being in the city is 
astronomically different than being in the middle of nowhere else we go. Um, our access to different services and different collaborations and different community service opportunities is vastly different. Um, but, and, and I think curricularly, like the academic aspect of some of my students, um, because they were in private high schools and had um, some more privilege in that area, some of them come in much more prepared or um, have these long leadership lists and can run a meeting without ever having that training to do so, um, where, you know, there are students who don't have that privilege or never had that experience in high school and are joining fraternity and sorority and need to be taught from the ground up on like what to do to conduct a meeting or how to balance a budget um, or what that looks like. And my, my students here are, are excellent and well-founded and they've also had a Greek advisor and someone to be in that position for years for them. And they've had support from the school and they've had budgetary and monetary support. So some of the leadership experiences, like I don't have to fight for a reason to go to NGLA for my students. That is an expectation is that our students go uh, versus trying to get, you know, my students from Oswego there for the first time ever because they had never had those resources. Um, so I am lucky to be in a community that has certain expectations and resources that are already put out and laid out. Um, I was at Oswego where they had built for the first time an accreditation system versus St. Joe's where they've had an accreditation system for 10 years and were reformatting and rebuilding and examining um, what it should be in and where the difficulties may lie or if we should be increasing those standards. Um, but it's different to have these policies and procedures in place and to come in from a different uh, lens and be like, okay, I can examine what's in place versus like start from the ground up. Um, and because there's that structure and expectation in place, a lot of the leaders have been adapted and transitioned into those structures. Um, and that's wonderful, but it's completely new. And also Philly language is completely different. I'm not, and I'm also not from Jersey. So they talk about things and I make lots of mistakes about geographical locations. Um, the Eagles are super important. I don't know anything about them. So sometimes there's, there's like a culture gap of like, I am truly a Philly transplant. Um, and they'll be like, it's down the street, Nicole. And I'm like, I don't, I still don't know what words you said. Um, we have to slow down, spell it out. What are we talking about? Um, so it's always interesting to go to a new school and a new community and feel like an outsider. Um, and and really here, it's like, I love that there's other like Philadelphia fraternity and sorority life advisors that reach out and collaborate together. And those SUNY had that in their system, we were so spread out geographically that we, it was a phone call. Here, uh, Drexel has a program for diversity and inclusion, Meet the Greeks. I can give my students train tickets and it's a 10 minute train ride and I can get them to a program that can vastly change their lives. Um, and that's just incredible and I love um, kind of still learning and being introduced to that and I'm really lucky to um, have the opportunity at a school that is in a city that has um, so many amazing uh, fraternity and sorority life programs and professionals and people that have come out of these schools and are now directors at other schools and can tell me the backstory of 10 years ago. Um, and that's great. But yeah, it's, def it's definitely a different campus, different community, different students um, for a wide variety of reasons. But um, I value both equally and they're both equally challenging in different ways. I love that you have all that support now. I think that's fantastic, especially locally in Philadelphia. Yes. Uh, that's great. Now, I know that we don't talk enough about supporting students with disabilities on college campuses, and I know that's something that you're very passionate about. So how can administrators and also other students do a better job in this area going forward? So two of the things that we really did, and I'll just talk like from a Panhellenic lens, for a second because I think most training and sorority advisors and kind of understand that sorority recruitment, formal sorority recruitment, primary recruitment is 
just crazy. There are women yelling everywhere and chanting loudly, and it's an overwhelming process weekend, week, two weekends, whatever it is. Um, it's hard if you have social anxiety, if you have any type of anxiety, um, if you are unsure, you're socially anxious. All of our recruitment counselors went through, we have um, a great partnership with the Kinney Center here, which is a center for autism, but they literally talked uh, to our students about, um, I mean, you're meeting women, and this is same for men, like in a recruitment event, you have these brief interactions and you make snap judgments. And that's kind of the nature of that process sometimes is like, did you have a good first interaction? Is it, was it good enough for a second interaction? But if you interact differently than someone else and that person you are interacting with and neither of you like connect and that's a disability, is that you have a social, you have social anxiety, you have a functioning disability, you're hard of hearing, um, you like just get overwhelmed, you have ADHD and there's so much going on in the, the room that you're like squirrel, squirrel, squirrel. Like these aren't functioning spaces for you to shine and be your best version of yourself. And our general chapter members are not educated in those differences at all, at all. They think that if someone's looking down at the floor or looking away or turning their attention or changing topics rapidly, that it means you're not interested in joining this community. But the fact of the matter is, is if I have any of those um, social disabilities or social anxieties that might keep me from talking or interacting with you slightly differently, the fact that I'm still here having that conversation means I want it more than anything because I know I'm going to appear differently to you than someone else. And we don't do enough to talk about that. We also don't do enough to give, so what we did, we did a lot of training with our Kinney Center about autism, about how you, social differences can present, what you may see and what it might actually be, how men and women present differently with social anxieties, um, how some of like that fidgeting and eye twirling and hair twirling, um, the weird subject changes, the being very blatant or crass, how that might, that might be someone's personality, but it, there might also be a chance for that to be something more. Um, and then we also did a Zen zone. So we turned one of our office spaces and we brought in a rock salt lamp, brought in like special foods and aromatherapy machine, pillows, blankets, but you put twinkle lights up. We kept the room dark. Um, we played spa music and it was, uh, we had like, that's where we had all of our band-aids, our pins, like all of our supplies. And I was like, if you need a, if you need a second, this is a Zen zone. Here are all these positive words of affirmation. We had like little signs up everywhere. Like go there, go sit on the couch, go sit there and relax and compose yourself. And we talked about it thinking no one was going to use it. So many students used it. So many of our leaders used it. So many of our chapter presidents, like after, like before voting started and after rounds came up and they were just like, I need a granola bar and a Band-Aid and just like sat for five minutes. Um, and because we made that intentional space and promoted it, like students know it was there and they were using the language as the Zen zone. Um, and that was really cool to see that people just had a place to sit outside of the chaos that was a little bit removed that was specifically for them. Um, we made sure that we talked about access to rooms and if you needed a chair or like what that looked like or, um, and we're very clear in all of our materials leading up to recruitment to contact and that we had accessibility um, maneuvers. And I know, for me especially, like I don't always need accessibility help. And sometimes I know that you're gonna look at me and be like, you don't need, like there's nothing wrong with you. Why do you need a chair? Like why do you need to, you know, like get up and move? Or like, why is that something you need? Because I look fine. Um, but when someone prompts that conversation or there's a form to fill out or there's a checkbox, um, in our registration form that says, do you have accessibility issues or are there any issues that you need for us to address? Allergies, 
Like, why do we ask about food allergies, but we don't ask about accessibility issues? Um, and for men, like, how many of us are and with COB have recruitment events and don't consider um, stairs, the fact that they're on lawns, um, the fact that they're in inaccessible buildings or in off campus buildings where I can't get to if I'm in a wheelchair, on crutches, have a boot, um, or if I have anxiety and I've never been to that location before. Why would I go to this random location that I'm not, like, I can find no information on that I've never heard of? I'm not going to Steve's house on like one, two, three, like Mountain Avenue. Like, I don't know. Like, that's super intimidating. Um, and I think we, we don't think about mental health in the way of it being health. Like, it is the health and well being of our students. And that health and well being is making sure that they can promote the best version of themselves. And we're doing them no services. <laughs> and giving them nothing to get there. We know we're putting them in stressful situations and we talk about how stressful the situations are and then leave, leave it right there. And it's like, but, like there's no, but here are all of the resources, coping strategies, like people to talk to. And then even the people that they talk to are often not trained properly to be able to have those conversations um, if a student is overwhelmed. And I'm trying to change that in my own little circle. Um, I'm trying to change the perception of women with disabilities, young women with disabilities, talking about me having a disability at work, um, trying to get people to understand that like, if I need to take a half day, it's not because I'm lazy or not passionate or that I don't care. Um, oftentimes I am the worst person because then I go home and I'm on my computer answering emails anyway, but I know I need to lay down, um, but I worry, all the time that I'm going to be perceived as lazy um, or not caring or not passionate enough because of my physical well-being and need. Um, and I just think we have to take that into account. More is not more. More is, is just more. And um, we're not giving students an opportunity to balance or take care of themselves. Um, especially in high stress seasons like recruitment. Right. And I think we can start just in recruitment and just talk about how to make recruitment accessible. This has been so helpful, Nicole. I know a lot of students are going to be listening to this, thinking about what their recruitment looks like on their campus and trying to make sure that they are keeping all of these things in mind. It's really eye-opening, and I'm glad that you shared all of that. Now, on a fun note, you know that I love to eat great food. So what is your favorite meal these days, and where can we go to get it? Oh, good. Well, <laughs> I... Um, I, this is the corniest thing. I love Trader Joe's. Okay. I haven't been let, like upstate New York. I couldn't order a pizza. Couldn't order Chinese food. No one delivered. There was one grocery store that was terrible. I have a Trader Joe's near me. They make great food. They have cheddar rockets. I don't know what cheddar rockets are or why they're so much better than goldfish, but I highly suggest cheddar rockets. I've been on a cheddar rocket kick. They're great. Loving it. Also, brandless. I get things, people will ship food to me now. I am in a location where people were like, oh yeah, we can get food. We'll deliver you crab ragoons from down the street. I have somewhere down the street that will deliver food to me. I can't even tell you what my favorite food is right now because I'm like in food euphoria. Like there's <laughs> so many options. There's actual grocery stores. There's a Dunkin' Donuts. Haven't seen one in three years. Like I'm overwhelmed with possibilities i've had the first good slice of pizza which i mean it's philly pizza so we can still we can still get up there yeah we'll figure it out but like i haven't had a real slice of pizza that wasn't from like chuck e cheese or like a microwave di giorno in two and a half years i haven't had oh my gosh i had a meal the other day that was uh, like a mediterranean fish dish, tilapia, and oh my, it was just incredible. And I didn't know what to do with myself because I haven't had a real piece of fish in like two years. So I would love to tell you that like, there's my one favorite meal, but I'm having so much fun literally every weekend exploring somewhere new in Philadelphia to eat 
And every weekend I'm like, this is my new favorite. I'm always coming here. I have to, I have to come back because I've just been food deprived. Um, the one thing I cannot give you a suggestion on, and my students are very upset about it. I haven't had a Philly cheesesteak yet. Oh. I know I've been here since like the end of August, but I haven't had one yet. And there's literally a place right across the street from me. Um, but I haven't, I don't know. I don't want to go down the hole because I, then I feel like I'm going to gain 35 pounds because I'm going to have to try every single one in the city to find the best one. And it's just a mission I'm not ready for yet because I'm still way too excited that there's like a good grocery store near me. Um, so I have to build up to the tolerance. Like I can, I can eat sushi again. I haven't had sushi. So for all of you that are on campuses in the middle of nowhere, you're at a Yukon in farm country, like you're at an Oswego where the closest city is 45 minutes away. Um, but somehow Oswego did have like 37 pizza places. Uh, or you are in a small town that, because you're a commuter, wherever you are, and you don't have access to amazing food. I'm so sorry. I feel your pain. Just know <laughs> that when you have the opportunity to get good food, go all out. Just splurge, enjoy yourself, save up some money because it really, it's, it's worth it to, to try new things. And Philly has tons of new things to try. There you go. So visit Philly and you'll get all yes. the great food. Oh, so Very much. nice. All right. So Nicole, where can our audience go to connect with you on social media? Is there somewhere they can go? Oh yeah. I mean, I'm definitely on Instagram heavily. My account is public because I like to set a good example for my students. You can see lots of pictures of me and my emotional support animal, Len. Uh, his name is Lenny Bond um, at Cole, C-O-L-E underscore Morse, M-O-R-S-E. It's also my Twitter handle. Um, it's also on Facebook. So I know I go by Nicole professionally. My entire life I was Coley. Uh, so the professional version of that, I guess, is just drop the Y and become Cole. So. Cole Morse. That's where you'll find me pretty much everywhere. Uh, and you can always find me at SJU and student leadership and activities and email me there. Perfect. Very good. So Nicole obviously has this incredible connection with her students. I recognize that immediately within five minutes of meeting Nicole. She obviously cares very deeply about all of them and ensuring that they have a great fraternity and sorority experience. So I'm so thankful that we have people like Nicole in this industry. You've been such a good friend and I really appreciate that. Yes. Wow. So, thank you. I get to see you in just a couple of days at NGLA. So Looking forward to it. Hartford, yeah. Connecticut. <laughs> yeah, Hartford, Connecticut. I already broke one of my, my uh, Greek university rings, so I need another one. All right, we'll the, get you another one. We yeah. have replacements. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All right, very good. Well, to the audience, thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you on an upcoming edition of Fraternity Foodie. Bye for now. Bye.